You've heard those notes. You've got that album. You know the legendary Paul McCartney. But do you know the other architects of the Live and Let Die song and score? Hello, my name is... Names is for tombstones, baby. Y'all take this honky out and waste him. Okay. Um, this morning, today or tonight, we're going to be travelling back in time, 50 years back in time, to 1973, to learn about two gentlemen who worked together to make the Live and Let Die song and score sound phenomenal. Their names, Sir George Martin and Bill Price. We're also going to wrap this into the new La La Land Records 50th anniversary soundtrack album. Let's dig in. What are you? Some kind of doomsday machine boy? Live and Let Die introduced the world to a new James Bond, actor Sir Roger Moore. Guy Hamilton's choice to treat the new Bond as on a business as usual mission and not even include him in the pre credit sequence was a bold and inspired move. Moore proved a safe pair of hands, earning respect of the audience, as Guy Hamilton put it, ultimately guiding James Bond from here through to the mid-1980s and via outer space along the way. Live and Let Die was Roger Moore's second favourite James Bond film, and it's easy to see why. It's a unique story involving supernatural elements. It has a wonderful array of henchmen and memorable characters, outstanding stunts, clever dialogue, loads of colour, and, of course, great music. So, let's connect some dots and dive into the world of James Bond, George Martin, Bill Price and Air Studios. Same time tomorrow, Mrs. Bell. We were taught never to trust machines too faithfully. The ears were always the best judge. Affectionately known as the fifth Beatle, George Martin was perhaps the greatest and most well-known record producer of the 20th century. He was born in 1926 in London, England, and came from a modest background. Following war service, he joined EMI in 1950 as an assistant to the head of Parlophone Records. It was here that he had a successful career working on classical and comedy albums. George Martin signed the Beatles to Parlophone in 1962 and went on to produce nearly all their studio albums, playing a crucial role in shaping their sound and pushing the boundaries of popular music. Although Martin's work with the Beatles is his most iconic, he also produced and collaborated with other notable artists such as Jerry and the Pacemakers, Cilla Black and Elton John. George Martin was known for his willingness to experiment. He incorporated innovative studio techniques, including tape loops, backward recordings and orchestral overdubs, helping the Beatles achieve their distinct and groundbreaking sound. Martin was also a skilled pianist and contributed musically to many Beatles songs. Most notably, he composed the orchestral arrangements for Eleanor Rigby, a Day in the Life, and the score to the Beatles' animated film Yellow Submarine. He was knighted in 1996, becoming Sir George Martin and inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999. George Martin passed away in 2016 at the age of 90. His contributions to music will continue to be celebrated and studied, he remains one of the most influential figures in the history of popular music. Relax, baby. Mr. Big's going to take care of you in a minute. A studio built by producers for producers. Associated Independent Recordings, known as AIR, was formed in 1965 by a consortium comprising George Martin and his business partners Ron Richards, John Burgess 
and Peter Sullivan, who were all successful record producers themselves. Leasing space on the fourth floor of the Peter Robinson department store at number 214 Oxford Street in London, Air Studios were under design in 1967. By June 1970, the facilities were equipped, tested and ready for limited use the following month. Bill Price and Jack Clegg were foremost in the engineering team. Dave Harries and Keith Slaughter were responsible for technical design and studio management respectively. Studio One, the main studio, was about 18 by 12 metres with a 6 metre high ceiling. For those on imperial measurements, that's about 60 by 40 feet with a 20 foot ceiling. It could accommodate about 65 musicians and included a projection screen for film work. A difficulty was managing the thunderous sounds of frequent tube trains beneath the surface as they rolled up to the fourth busiest station in the London Underground. Kenneth Shearer, who designed the 1960s acoustic treatment of the Royal Albert Hall, capably supplied a solution. The acoustic studio spaces were entirely decoupled from the floor resting upon large springs. At the time Live and Let Die was scored, equipment at Air Studio One comprised Neumann condenser and AKG dynamic microphones, a 24 input, 16 output Neve mixing console designated build number A29, eight limiter compressor modules, five EMT echo plates, as well as an acoustic echo chamber built into an old bathroom or restroom, Tannoy gold monitor speakers and enclosures designed by Dave Harries, Dolby A301 noise reduction units, 3M16 track 2-inch tape machines, and Philips film projectors. In his biography, All You Need Is Ears, George Martin explained how no expense had been spared. Our first console at air, built by Rupert Neve, who makes the Rolls Royce of recording desks, was a 16 track and cost £35,000. At the time, we thought that was a lot of money. And it is now. It's the equivalent of about half a million pounds, or US$635,000 in 2023. Air proudly boasted that they were the first studio to synchronise 16-track tape with film projection. Doing so enabled the multi-track to start in lockstep with film projection and reliably ensure the discrete moments being timed by the conductor and orchestra were exactly reproducible later. Fundamentally, this increased flexibility in mixing choices and maintained the utmost fidelity through both film and album mixes. This capability was used on Live and Let Die. Studio time for film work was nominally charged at £35 per hour, running with a normal crew of five men. That's the equivalent of about £420 or 550 US dollars per hour in 2023. In September of 1973, Air became the first major studio in the UK to incorporate 24-track recording. A new Neve mixing console was installed as part of the upgrades, which were rather impressively completed during a weekend. <laughs> For snake, I forgot I should have told you you should never go in there without a mongoose. Quite simply, Bill Price was a gifted virtuoso engineer. Known for his attention to detail, planning and ability to capture the energy of a live performance into a dynamic mix, Price embraced new technologies and experimented with different methods to achieve unique sounds. One of Price's most significant collaborations was with the punk rock band The Clash. He engineered and co-produced their landmark album, London Calling, released in 1979. 
The album is considered a punk rock masterpiece and is regarded for its excellent production quality. Winning a place in the Grammy Hall of Fame, it helped shape the sound of the punk and new wave genres. Bill Price was born in 1944 and passed away in 2016 at the age of 72. Starting at Decker West Hampstead in 1962 and later becoming chief engineer and manager of Wessex Studios, Price collaborated with numerous artists over the years. Some of his most notable engineering and production credits include albums for Tom Jones, The Sex Pistols, Pete Townsend, The Pretenders and Guns N' Roses. The latter is of particular significance to us as Price mixed Live and Let Die for Guns N' Roses some 18 years after doing so for Paul McCartney and Wings, which neatly brings us back to Live and Let Die. Any cost, any, I wonder must die. Paul McCartney, Wings and a large orchestra assembled at air for a day of recording on the 19th of October 1972. Overdubs were undertaken the following day, including Ray Cooper on percussion. Producer George Martin led the orchestra and supervised the mix, made on the 21st of October with 28-year-old Bill Price behind the console. Price later recalled to author Howard Massey, There were so many tracks and so many different takes, so I mixed all the different bits and then edited together the two-track. Engineer Jack Clegg, who had extensive film score recording experience, was penciled in to work on Live and Let Die. Clegg was an obvious choice, having recorded 1967's Casino Royale for Burt Bacharach at the Cine Tele Sound Studios, aka CTS, prior to joining Ayer's roster of fine engineers. However, according to Clegg, fate would intervene with a combination of Bill Price's suitability with rock and rhythm-based multi-track recording and a requirement to attain membership of the Association of Cinematograph, Television and Allied Technicians, the ACTT, by undertaking work directly related to film. Sessions for George Martin's score took place in May of 1973 in Studio One, with the original soundtrack LP released in July. Much had transpired in the time between the recording of the Live and Let Die song in October of 1972 and the score in May of 1973. A bomb scare had been called in November 1972, Whilst occupants of the building dutifully filed out onto the street, air kept working away. Management surmised that disrupted sessions were more likely than any real bomb. Bill Price prepared a quadraphonic mix of the Live and Let Die album in Air Studio 2 on the 29th of September 1973, almost one year after recording the song. Of interest is that the Quadmaster was prepared without Dolby A, one of Price's techniques for keeping the sound fresh and punchy. Buy the power, invested in me, buy this playlist. I hereby do commandeer this video and all those persons within. And that means you, smart ass. <laughs> ah! Ha 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 